welcome to uh, this World Transplant Day 2022 Roundtable. Uh, my name is Anna Morgan Pilardi, and I will be moderating uh, the Roundtable today. Um, we're super excited to be coming together to discuss the world of transplant and donation. Um, today I'm joined by some of the world's most wonderful recipients and advocates. Uh, uh, let's take a minute to introduce them. I'd like to welcome Denise Redeker, the CEO of Heartfelt Health Foundation and Heart Transplant recipient. Brooke Gerard, um, liver transplant recipient and founder of the Bonus Years podcast. Lorena Pitts um, is a heart transplant recipient from France. Danny Hiles, a liver transplant recipient and founder of the Danny Chats podcast. Aileen Young Hager um, is a heart transplant recipient from Norway. Zach Brooks is a two time kidney transplant recipient and founder of World, Trans World Transplant Athletes and Jesse, a brand new executive director of the Chris Kluge Foundation. So um, thank you all for uh, joining us and let's kick off with a little bit about transplant life. Um, the transplant process can be extremely daunting for those who are just starting out in the process or even those who are 10 years in. So what comes along with the transplant diagnosis? Um, I think, oh, I was gonna say, I think for me, it's, it was, a lot of fear, the trans knowing knowing that I was going to need a transplant. For me personally, the distance between there's no other option but transplant and transplant happened in about a two week span of time. Um, so I didn't have a whole lot of time to process it, but it it hits you like a cement truck, really. I mean, it's just for me, it was something that I had heard the word before, but I never knew it was really going to happen to me until it did and then it was like being hit by a cement truck Danny yeah I was going to say pretty much the same uh, I was told that I was going to need a liver transplant when I was younger and they, they kind of offered me one when I was younger but I went on medication but then 15 20 years later when they sat me down and they said it's time for your transplant it still was like wow like you know this is this is big and you have that sort of moment where everything goes quiet and you're like wow oh. And it takes a while to process. I mean, for me, the the first time around, the second time is different. The first time around, I think there was a lot of fighting. You know, why me? You know, I'm a victim. My life sucks. Um, it shouldn't happen to me. All those kind of things. And that, for me, to, took about a month before I finally just told myself to snap out of it and just deal with it. But I kind of really fought that diagnosis for about a month or so because I was really upset. Similarly, um, I was I was healthy my entire life, um, and at 20 got diagnosed with autoimmune hepatitis, and then within six weeks was in liver failure. Um, so the the wrestling of like, <laughs> what do I do? Uh, is this something I want for my life? I don't know anything about transplant. I honestly didn't even know what was going on in my own body. Um, and there are a lot of patients who <laughs> who who come at it from that side where it's very sudden very quick um, and the processing has to happen later. Lawrence, you're muted. Sorry, I had a quite different experience because I spent a couple of years in heart failure and I'm a very uh, big uh, Googleizer of medical problems, which I probably shouldn't be, but I guess we all do that around here. Um, and I auto-diagnosed the fact that I was gonna need a heart transplant and all my doctors were denying it. And this lasted for years. It lasted for actually like three or four years. And um, all my family, my friends were in denial of it. My doctors were in denial of it and I knew it was coming. So it was very different because I spent uh, three years basically fighting against nothing, against wind, trying to get used to this diagnosis that I had placed on the situation. And when finally uh, my cardiologist said, yeah, you're gonna need transplant, it came as a huge relief. So I actually cried with relief, which seems crazy to most people, but it was like, okay, finally someone is listening. Um, so that's, it was, it was quite, nobody has ever told me that they, they were they cried with happiness maybe that was also because I didn't realize how hard it was going to be but um it came as a big relief 
I think if I'd have known what transplant was going to be like, like what life was going to be like after my transplant, I probably would have cried with relief. But for me, like I didn't know what life was going to be like at all. Um, I didn't know anyone that had a transplant. I'd never looked into it, even though they'd said about years ago. So for me, it was like, what is life going to be like? Is it? I didn't really expect it to be this great, to be honest. Yeah, I think you um, brought up a really great point there, Lawrence. So do you think Google um, coming into this day and age is kind of a benefit for transplant recipients or potential transplant recipients, maybe helping them become more of an advocate for themselves? Um, or how do you think that has affected? It's, uh, it's beneficial. It shouldn't be because it's not complete. Uh, you can easily go down the rabbit hole I have auto-diagnosed myself with so much shit that wasn't true, you know. So I think, and we all know that Google is extremely dangerous, but um, doctors, I don't wanna, you know, talk shit about doctors because uh, they, they have saved my life and I'm grateful to all their personal and, and professional investment, but they are so unwilling to listen at times um and they just seem to have in my experience i have had so much stuff brush brushed off um like no it's not that you're gonna be fine no 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 don't worry that google has uh, unfortunately well been of great assistance to me even though there are obviously bad sides to it but yeah it's been it's been very helpful i don't think we heard from eileen yet about your experience i want to hear from you too well, um, I was on the heart transplant waiting list for four to five months. And um, for me, that was so terrible that it actually was kind of a relief when the phone call finally came. Uh, and that surprised me because I didn't want the heart transplant, but living with heart failure was so hard. So you realize at some point there is only one way forward. Um, and I was actually at heart transplant assessment nine years before that too. And my children were very young at that point. They were aged two and seven. Um, so for me, um, I, was, I was really scared at that time because they were so young. I was afraid I would die and they wouldn't remember me. So uh, when I finally got to heart transplant, it, it was a relief, but I was also very scared. I had Googled a lot and Frank myself to death. And also I'm not, <laughs> I'm not your regular Norwegian. So, uh, uh, so there was a lot of uh, uncertainty uh, if, a, if a heart, a suitable heart would show up in time because uh, I have a rare blood type for Norway. So there were, yeah, a lot to consider. Well, thanks everyone for sharing. Um, does anyone have anything to add about sort of the process of transplants, the good, the bad, the ugly that comes post your transplant? Um, obviously, it's not just a one and done kind of uh, thing. It continues for years. So does anyone have anything to add about that? Well, I'll say something about the, the Google and research in general on the internet. I mean, I, I mean, kind of like the other comments, I, on the whole, I think it's positive. But having studied decision making, it's really important to have really good anchors. So as painful as some of the doctors can be, I think they serve as good anchors because you shouldn't get too far away from some of the things they're saying because you can drift off into quackery. You know, people just trying to sell a pill for a couple of dollars or someone who, you know, promises a, a better life. And I had to deal with some of that as well. Someone was like, oh, if you just take these pills or massages or this sort of weird Chinese kind of thing. And like, there's a lot of good Chinese medicine, but this one was not. I was in San Francisco at the time. So I think, you know, Google is really good, but you have to really mind your anchors and not get too far away from some really solid scientific evidence. Because in the end, you know, I'm here because people for, you know, over 70 years now have been doing, uh, working on this approach of, of medicine. So that's my own a tip on, on using Google. I, I totally agree with that. I know I'm very guilty of uh, overusing Google, but I do agree with you. It's just that sometimes it's so frustrating. And sometimes maybe things are different in the US. We've had this discussion many times with Denise that you are clients, we are patients. 
um, there is a great side to having a, a state funded healthcare system and I wouldn't change it for the world, um, even though there are other challenges, but um, it's that we don't have to pay, which is in our case, amazing. Uh, yeah, but the other, uh, the, the, the downside is that we take what we are given. We can't complain. Um, and I see that, you know, Eileen is because she's in the same situation as I am. Sometimes I'll go for a day in the hospital, you know, you, when you have like a whole day of assessment and I will finish my exams, let's say at 1, 11 a.m. And I can wait for like seven, eight hours to see my doctor. And I can just say nothing anyway, because that's the way it is. It's free and uh, you can't complain. You're not a client. So sorry, I'm totally drifting off from the topic, uh, but it's, um, I don't even know what the topic was anymore. <laughs> it was <laughs> I, I th with the using Google, um, when I was diagnosed, uh, they luckily picked it up for me, but I speak to a lot of Wilson's disease patients that have all the symptoms. But I mean, this was an example of what a doctor said to someone is that's so rare, you can't possibly have that. Um, so I think if people can take these symptoms to their GPs or their doctors and be like, look, this is, this is what it is can you please test me for this? Can you do this? Then I think that's quite important rather than the, the doctors just dismissing it. That makes me uh, think about just how advocacy for ourselves might look different from country to country. Mm. Um, because I, I'm i still learning, I'm 17 years post liver transplant and I'm still learning the best way to advocate for myself while still uh, falling into what we call being compliant. Uh, and Denise and I could probably talk about this for, for, hours, for uh, hours because being compliant is so important in the U.S. And I, I can't speak to other countries, so I would love to hear from you all. But um, if they deem you not compliant, you aren't going to be eligible for another transplant. Uh, so, like, it's this fine line of learning to walk where you say, I'm not well and I can tell something's off um, and I need your help. And I'm going to get help. <laughs> I'm going to figure out how to get help for myself. Um, and the language that I've started using is like, you know, we have all these different specialists that support our health, but I am the only person who is the specialist in me as a whole person. Um, and so I take it really seriously when I think about my whole health um, because no one knows unless I tell them. And so, um, I just, I think it's really powerful to think about that in different contexts. And I would love to hear uh, how it is in Norway and France and the UK as far as like advocacy versus compliance, if that's even language um, that you all use. All country, uh, we're only 5 million people. So there aren't a lot of heart transplants uh, around. Uh, so I felt alone um, and there wasn't, there's not a heart transplant community to reach out to um, pretty much. So, um, and also we only have one transplant. Uh, there's no going elsewhere if things doesn't work out. So, um, so I've, been, um, I've been open about heart transplant, heart failure on my Instagram account. And a lot of Norwegians have reached out because uh, that's the kind of information we don't get. And we also have uh, public health care for which we are grateful. But it also means that uh, there's only one source of information. Uh, so, uh, um, and there's um, there's a lot of pressure I feel uh, for for uh, organ transplant recipients to be grateful, and we are grateful uh, by all means. But there's also there's a fine line between being grateful and um, not being honest about post transplant life as it is. I, I obviously agree uh, with what you said about being honest about post-transplant life, but I am happy I didn't know. Um, I'm gonna have to disagree with you, Danny, on that. Um, I, I'm, I was actually, I'm actually very happy I didn't know how hard some challenges were gonna be. Um, I think there's a big difference and I've noted because I know transplant recipients from different kinds of organs. A lot of the heart transplant recipients were not ill when they were young. So uh, we have a before and after. 
uh, we know what it's like uh, to be in good health. Like Danny, you were always sick when you were a kid, from what I from what I understood. You were always in survival mode. I have a very good friend who's had um, uh, a double lung transplant, and all her life she was sick, so she only got the good stuff from her transplant. But I used to water ski. I used I, I had a totally normal life before uh, going into heart failure. I mean, I knew I was supposed to not do some stuff because yeah, we knew there was this problem, but that was it. So um, am I grateful that I got a transplant? Yes. Do I resent the pressure to be always grateful? Yes, enormously. Um, the one thing that drove me the, the crazy one day was when my doctor presented me to another doctor as meet Miss Apitz, who is the incredibly lucky recipient of a heart. And I just wanted to say, you know, I'm sorry, if being born with a genetic condition and fighting for my life uh, all these years and going through all this, if you call that being lucky, that is not luck, I'm sorry. I can't, I, I can't, I really, it, it really drives me crazy when people say that. So am I grateful that I'm alive and that somebody was smart enough to uh, uh, let me uh, have this, 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 um, this heart? And that's another subject I'm sure that we'll, we'll talk about later. Of course, am I, am I grateful that there are people who work 24 seven to make this work? Yes. But do I think I'm lucky? I wouldn't go that far. <laughs> I think that's really valid. And um, I was not sick at all for 20 years <laughs> and then got sick and within six weeks had a, a liver in my body that I had no, no idea what was going on. Um, because of that um, and what you called the pressure <laughs> to always be grateful, <laughs> I, I definitely felt that and I'm years out um, working through some of that in therapy because there's a lot of medical trauma even if your transplant goes perfectly um, and there's a lot of pressure maybe pressure is not the right word for me personally but i definitely feel like as a person who advocates for organ donation and wants to like show what a recipient's life is like there's a certain persona that's accepted more than others um, and what i spend most of my time talking about is the toll it took on my mental health that I was completely unaware of, that no one prepared me for, um, the, the feelings of survivor's guilt, um, like why am I allowed to be alive when someone else died? Um, why, you know, why at 20 am I just like able to get a transplant so fast and other people are waiting for a long time? And then trying to reintegrate into uh, a norm normal college kid's life going back to school, um, learning to set healthy boundaries uh, around my time and my energy. Like nobody at 20 says no to things. They just do whatever they want. Um, and so I had to like reconcile this like invincible feeling that I had before in myself with like the reality that no, I need a certain amount of sleep to function and I have to have timers to take my meds. And how much do I wanna tell my friends about what's going on um, versus how much do I need to disclose for my own safety and wellness being away from my family. Um, and I think there are just layers and layers of like our mental health that we could unpack. <laughs> um, maybe we could do a series because it's just at, at different stages in transplant, it's been different for everyone. And there have been times where I've been just so grateful to be alive. Um, but compared to like a normal day, like it's, it's still a struggle sometimes. And I don't want people to walk into transplant thinking that it's a cure because really it's a Band-Aid um, and it gives us life. Uh, but there are days that I ask myself, is this the life that I want? Um, I, and I know that I am not a typical transplant recipient. I have a lot of complications. I've had a lot of rejection episodes. Like, Danny's freaking like healthy and doing exercise and stuff he never could do before. And I'm like, I'm going to maybe walk the dog this week. Like, it's just it's different from person to person. Uh, so I don't ever want to give the impression that we're all the same because we're totally not. Um, even though we've all received transplants, we <laughs> we are definitely different.
Um, so yeah, I mean, I think uh, Lawrence and Brooke have really like, maybe it is an entire series that there's this font, this volcano of kind of emotions that we could probably talk about. I mean, just what came to my mind, you know, this is, um, you know, I got my two transplants, one in my 20s, one in my 30s, like at the prime of my life and talk to people like, oh, you know what, they, they have these assumptions about how wonderful things are for me, um, especially after my first transplant, someone told me, oh, you must have such a great perspective. And maybe like Lawrence and Brooke and I, I literally wanted to hit that person. Like, so I'm the one who has to carry around the mantle of a great perspective while you get to be the person who just gets to talk about the person with a great perspective. And it took me like 15 years to figure out what it meant because I did have a great perspective after that, but what did it mean to me? And I finally boiled it down for myself, which is on one hand uh, from my two transplant experiences, my parents as donors and all sorts of other things, I have like incredible empathy and sympathy and a huge heart that I didn't necessarily have before for human suffering and people's uh, legitimate hard uh you know, dignified desires to make it through that suffering to the best of their ability. Like I absolutely have that and more of it. That's the beautiful part of the transplant experience for me. On the other hand, I can't deal with any bullshit. I have a really like low tolerance for that. So um, that was the perspective I had, but I really can't stand who that person was so long ago who said, oh, you must have such a great perspective. So yeah, I could talk about this for a long time, like Brooke and Lawrence and everyone else. Uh, and maybe we could do a, a series on this. But I think that's really important uh, if you're watching this and thinking, how am I going to be afterwards? Well, it is a wonderful thing to have. And you're going to have other uh, struggles. And guess what? You have this really cool community of people here on Danny's channel, on everyone else's channel, my channel, uh, that you can talk to now that a lot of us didn't have when we were going through our journey. So anyway, this is just great. And thanks, Anna and everyone else at CK after doing this uh, that's my thought about that i i think things would have been different for me if i had known that the transplant community the online transplant community existed before my transplant um it would have probably avoided all this googling uh or, or a bit of it um i actually created my instagram account three weeks before my transplant. Well, when I got listed, because I, I only stayed three weeks on the list, which goes to show you how right I was when I said I needed a transplant and no one believed me. Um, so I created my account. I didn't really know what to expect, but I thought, you know, maybe I can meet some people, you never know. And, and then all of a sudden I was in the hospital and I had a terrible post-transplant. It was, it was horrendous. And all these people were sending me messages, you know, and these people saying, it's going to be fine. You're going to get better. Uh, it's bringing tears to my eyes just talking about it. it. It They really saved me. Really. It's what made getting, kind of going through the hospital bit bearable. Knowing that there would be an after because people who had that after were telling me it was true. Absolutely. I, I, I could not agree with low more i just it's this community and finding this community saved me saved me um finding eileen and low saved me um and because you know i don't know and i really would be interested to see how it is like for jenny in england and and eileen in norway and low and I, I don't know how it is for other people but for me they threw me into this support group meeting with a bunch of 75 year old men yep. who had, had heart transplants yep. and, and all of their wives were complaining about what bears they were to live with and how horrible they were because of the prednisone. And, and, and I burst into, I literally burst into tears and thought, well, this isn't, this is not the path for me. I don't want this transplant. If that's what it's going to turn me into, if it's going to turn me into someone that everyone in my life hates to be around because of the prednisone. I don't want to be in that world. That's not who I want to be. And I, I mean, I remember sobbing in the hallway and, and just thinking, what have I gotten myself into? What is, what is coming my way is, is, I hate to say it, is death a better option at this point? And because those were my options, transplant or death. And, and I, I mean, clearly I went through with the transplant, but it wasn't, if it weren't for me sitting in a hospital bed and, and looking on at that time, Facebook, I didn't, I 
didn't even think to look on Instagram at the, that moment in time, but looking on Facebook and finding someone who looked like me, who was my age, who was running half marathons. And I was like, you, mm. and I gave this poor woman no choice at all. Luckily she's lovely and we're still friends, <laughs> but I gave this woman no choice. I messaged her on Facebook and said, will you be my friend? I, I mean, basically I, I need somebody like you who's figured this out who's not complaining, who seems to have this worked out. And she, you know, obviously said, I don't have all this worked out, but this is what I'm doing. And she was five years post. So she's now almost 10 years post. And um, it was, it was life-saving for me because then I had somebody that I could look to and say, okay, that's, that's who, that's, that's the direction I want to head. When, when my recovery, because my recovery was similar to the lows, it was terrible. Um, I had three open heart surgeries in the span of a week. I, I, I almost died three times post-transplant. I was far less healthy post immediately post-transplant than I was pre. Um, but, but having this internet community gave me the hope that things were going to get better, gave me the ability to set a goal that when I got out of the hospital, that this was what I wanted to do. That was what I wanted to do. And that's, I mean, anybody who's watching this, I would really encourage if you don't, if you're not finding the right support, like within your team and within your group, um, it's an easy search online and you can find people like us who are very willing to, to help mentor you through the process and tell you at least what our experience was, because everybody's experience is different. You know, all the, all the things that people say about um, uh, social media, which I totally agree with, with that social media is super toxic and all the stuff people say. Well, the transplant community is the absolute contrary of that. Yeah. That's what I want to say. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Just to add on to that is, and what Denise was saying was, um, after my transplant, I didn't know where things were going to go. I had that sort of similar experience in hospital of being we had a talk from somebody who was, you know, he was living a very, very sheltered life through his own choice, but it wasn't the life that I wanted to continue after. So I had all these questions and uh, unlike Denise, I didn't really want to just message someone uh, and ask them the question. So I disguised it in the fact of like, oh, let's record a podcast. Um, so people were willing to come on and talk to me. So I was gaining all this information uh, and, you know, I just thought, oh, well, this is great because I'm learning and we can put it out there. So yeah, and talking to people like uh, Gillian Best from Canada, who swam across Lake Ontario, uh, you know, like when you hear that, it just really, because, uh, you know, I didn't know what I could do. And when you see that and the way I feel, I'm like, wow, you know, that's possible for, for me. So all them stories and hearing the other sides of the stories of, you know, people saying that I really struggled mentally after, which I did. I found the mental recovery was a lot harder than the physical recovery for me. And I went through counseling and everything else. And I think a lot, a lot of patients do, but not everyone always talks about that side. So yeah, talking to people in the transplant community is very, very uh, beneficial. Yeah, social media is definitely one, one thing that has helped. And there's a lot of, um, we work closely with a lot of different organizations and one is a completely anonymous platform for transplant recipients to go on and ask all of these questions. And, you know, then they don't have the pressure of people knowing who they are or anything like that. It's completely anonymous, which I think is a great, great tool. Um, so let's move on a little bit. We have um, two or three from both an opt-in and an opt-out system. So what are our opinions on each of those uh, stance? I mean, opt out, I think the numbers suggest it's just better for waiting list. Um, and if, you know, shorter, so just, you know, anyone who's listening the first time, if you have a shorter waiting list, that means your chances of getting heart, kidney, lung, whatever it is you need quicker are better. And that reduces um, the after, you know, kind of treatment uh, issues you have to deal with. I mean, the, the less time you're on sort of dialysis and other things, you know, likely someone's going to be able to treat you better afterwards. So I think the opt out program is better because it reduces the waiting list time. I mean, to me, the numbers suggest very clearly why that's a better option. I'm in the United States where we don't have that. So I wish I were in a country where we do have, did, that, did have that sometimes. Anna, could you explain briefly opt in versus opt out for people who may not even know about this yet? 
Yep, absolutely. So opt in is a system where um, donors have to register as um, to um, give the gift of life after they pass. So it is going into the DMV and registering yourself. An opt out system is you are automatically deemed a organ donor unless you specify that you do not want to be. Um, there is two ways for an opt out system to be overruled um, where you choose to opt out or your family chooses to opt out. An opt in system only has one way of you um, signing up and one way of you removing yourself and that that's your decision. So that's the kind of two differences. So I know someone, uh, Zach mentioned that America is the, the uh, opt, opt in. We, we, that was us until the UK very recently. Um, I think it might have been earlier this year that they changed it to an opt out system. So we're kind of yet to see the full benefits. But like Zach said, I, I can't imagine it. It's got to be a lot better because you are going to get a lot more people that donate their organs. Um, but for us, it's a case when we try to tell people about it, it's still important to speak to their families because Anna said that, uh, as Anna mentioned, it's kind of them that have the ultimate say uh, when it comes to it. So it's really important that people let their family or their next of kin and people around them know that they want to be donors. And it doesn't have to be a big conversation. It can just be something very short and simple, like, you know, oh, one day, you know, if this happens, I would love to be a donor. And that's it. Eileen, I know you're getting involved with uh, Norway's organ donation program. Can you speak to that a little bit? Yes, I can. Uh, we have an opt-in system, and I know it's been discussed um, a lot of times, and we're still in an opt-in system. And uh, I, uh, what I've been told is that uh, similar countries with similar healthcare systems don't see a rise in numbers, uh, even if they go for an opt-out system and um, Norwegians are generally, um, they have a high uh, their trust in, uh, in government. Uh, but as we saw uh, during the pandemic, as soon as people are, feel pressured into something like vaccinations, um, the protests get some more uh, vocal and the emotions get so, there are so much more emotions involved. Uh, so. What we feel is that um, information, education um, is more important than forcing people into an opt-out system because it, it often forces people to make a decision before they know, before they have the facts. So <laughs> I, have to trust, uh, I have to trust the system. Is that hard for you? Well, um, I also have a I have a son um, uh, who's sick. He's he has heart failure. It's a genetic disease. So um, when I think of him, I wish that we could just force everybody to be organ donors. But I also know that it doesn't work very well. Uh, people need to be given a choice. Uh, so that's why I'm involved with education and information and advocacy. Mm -hmm. I feel really torn between uh, opt-in versus opt-out because I keep reading about both both sides of it. And as a patient who needed a transplant, it seems fantastic that it would just everyone would be a donor and you could choose to opt out. Um, and then the side of me that wants uh, autonomy over my own health care. Um, and to be able to make my own decisions about what I do with my body. Um, like, I, I feel that very deeply, too. Um, and so, and I don't, I don't know if I trust or distrust the government, depending on what day it is. But I, uh, I feel like I can trust my own intuition. And, and so at this point, I, th I think I lean towards the educational component um, and continuing to educate people about what their options are. Um, even though, like Eileen, I totally, I feel that, <laughs> that depth of like, I just wish everyone would do it. Like, because that's, because that's your reality right now. Um, like you're caring for your son and it would have changed things for you. Um, and I think sometimes we, we frame this as a really black and white, um, option <laughs> and I, there just aren't that many things that are black and white anymore. Um, and so I just always think 
as as I'm talking to people, being aware of their perspective, being aware of um, other perspectives that we can come at it uh, humbly <laughs> without all the information and have a good dialogue about it. Um, because Danny and I talked a lot about opt-in versus opt-out right as it was changing in the UK. And I was like, yeah, let's do it. Let's make it happen in the US. And then I started reading some articles um, and, and talking to some people I know here that are in that process in the U.S. And I, w- I wish that things were easier, <laughs> I guess is what I'm saying. I wish um, I wish everyone could be helped and we could all have our own decision-making power, but we would all make the right decisions and the best decisions. Um, and that would be clean and tidy. And that's just not life. <laughs> life is not clean and tidy, especially in our world when we look at you know, what we've gone through, what we're going through, medication management, mental health, (laughs) you know, all the different things. So that's kind of where I land on that. I think it's important. um, It's important that people understand that an opt-out system is never going to be a a totally opt-out system because families always have last word, which is totally understandable because imagine the situation, somebody just died their family is grieving, they're crying, and they take away the body because the person hasn't opted out to, 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 to take its organs. That would be an unbearable. So um, that's why the family always has the last word. But so there is never, the, the, the opt-out system will never be 100%. It's, the, the ad, ad, advocacy is still necessary because in the end, uh, it's the family um, who decides. That's very yeah. important that people realize that in all the opt-out countries, like most European countries, um, it's really important to speak to your family. Yeah. I find, I speak to high school students every semester about organ donation because here in California, um, you're required to have a segment, the fresh, freshman high school students are required to have a segment on organ donation um, before they get their driver's license. So I go in, I'm, I am the check mark box of talking to kids about organ donation and what that looks like and the real life story about, you know, this is what happens when you get to donate your organs is you get someone like me who talks to you about organ donation <laughs> and is a transplant recipient. But every semester, I am so disheartened to hear kids, and I mean, they're kids, so that's, that's one reason but telling me stories from a Netflix movie that they watch that's ridiculous or, or, you know, that, that they're, that doctors aren't going to save them because that's what they saw in a Netflix movie or a, or, or, or that's what they saw because Hollywood presents it because it tells a more dramatic story if they lie about how the organ donation process works. And so every semester, half my job is dispelling these myths that largely Hollywood puts out there um, and and movies put out there. There's a Netflix movie that I wish I could remember the name of right now that was last semester. Every single class I talked to, and I talked to eight classes of of freshman kids, every single class brought up this movie um, that was a limited series on Netflix last early this year squid games squid games nope it's not that one it's it was a it was a uh, i can't remember i i I, I would totally know the name but it's it's a it's an ongoing process it's not i i don't hear the religious exemptions like i used to a few years ago like people my my religion nobody nobody believes that really anymore here but hollywood if if there's a movie out there that that portrays organ donation or a tv show that portrays organ donation in some sort of weirdly negative way like they're not going to work to save your life or any of those things we hear about it in classrooms all the time and it keeps kids from signing up to be organ donors 100 percent. we um you know part of our our whole thing is to talk to educate and inspire young people so like denise we talk to them regularly and it's crazy how many, you know, have these perceptions of it because they've seen it on a TV show. And once you sit there and you tell them, they're like, oh, wow, that's really cool. 
Like, that's really cool that I can do that for somebody else. Yes, 100%. I will be a dono. What is that even a question? And as soon as you break that myth that they've heard, they're 100% in and then you hear them telling every, all of their friends exactly what they've heard. And it's it's a great, great method. But yeah. Anyone else want to add? Uh, I just want to say that it's the same in the UK that people still believe that uh, if you're an organ donor, the doctor won't save you um, and stuff like that. But also, I think knowing all my friends, loads of them are like, oh, yeah, I'll be an organ donor, but they're all too lazy to sign up. So I think the opt out system's good because, you know, it, it just saves them doing anything as such. Because, like I say, loads of people are lazy. They'll say they'll do something, but they, we, we, we don't have like a, like Denise was saying, where you go to have your driving license and you have to do this course or anything. We don't have that. Um, it's literally, if you wanted to sign up, I suppose you just have to go online or speak to your doctors. And again, people are kind of lazy for that. Awesome. So let's move on. Um, let's take a look at sort of activity um, post-transplant. Um, I know it's obviously different for everybody individually. Um, some people can be super active. Some are a little more affected and cannot. So what's everyone's opinions there? Well, this is the entire premise of, you know, world transplant athletes. You know, if you have a body with a new part, you are a world transplant athlete. So we we divide the kind of world into three things. This follows along a fair, fair amount of research to the, you know, general activity. So moving around the house, whatever that is. And that's extremely important. I mean, Brooke spoke about that directly. We're, we're talking, world transplant athletes is talking to people about doing a series of podcasts, just people who just move in a basic level. And that's the most important level because anyone, whether they're, you know, get to more athletic type of ventures later, that's where they start. So that's, you know, extremely important. The next level is exercise, you know, more sort of frequent kind of activities. And the last level is training. And that's for a smaller group of people. So we really think this is the most fundamental thing to have, you know, especially with the, for our mission of our organization is to have recipients talk to other recipients and encourage them to move, whatever that movement means. And it's not about uh, being an athlete at all. I mean, it's called World Transplant Athletes. Yeah, but really it's just about movement. And um, if we can inspire other people just to move after their, their transplant and through these kind of networks and others talk to each other and say, hey, you know, you walked uh, five minutes today. Fantastic, great. Well, tomorrow you can walk six. You know, we can encourage each other then individually, and I think everyone else has spoken to this, we can improve our lives, uh, you know, together. And this is what um, I'm kind of losing in some trains of thought because I have so many at the same time. But, you know, it's really, I think, important if you're watching this from the outside that, you know, you as an individual are going to remain very individual after your transplant journey. Like it, one thing that I really like about these conversations is that we all have a lot of respect for each other as individuals, like my story is not the same as Eileen's or Brooks or Denise's or anyone else's, but I really respect how individual that story is. Um, and so there's not like a, a stamp that we're all healthy and perfect right now. No, we all have very individual journeys continually. And in terms of getting back to world transplant athletes, we just wanna help you on your journey through movement. And we really believe that your, your short-term health and your long-term health and your happiness will be positively impacted by simply being active. So, you know, uh, we can talk about, I can talk about this stuff for a long time. So we, we absolutely love it and our team of people. And I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the conversation here. Yeah, I, Jack, I agree with you. I, um, having the motivation to, um, to move post-transplant, one of the nurses when I was in the hospital and not doing well at all, um, told me to set a goal. Set a, set a movement goal, set something I wanna do that I wasn't able to do pre-transplant. And I picked a hike. There's a um, local to me, there's a uh, waterfall, gorgeous waterfall that falls onto the beach um, in Marin County. Y'all should come and see it, it's gorgeous. Um, and it's called Alamere Falls. And um, it's a pretty aggressive four mile hike out, four mile hike back. Um, pre-transplant, that was not an option. That was not an option for me. Um, and, but I've always wanted to see it. I've seen pictures of it. I've always wanted to see it. So that was what I did in the hospital was set a movement call and then worked my butt off to get to that place once I got out. And, and then 
when I finally got out there, I thought this is easy. And, and what a miracle that was. Um, watching Eileen hike has just been so inspirational to me, man, makes me want to travel too, but, um, but, and watching Danny do all of, you know, to do his training, it's all of that is super inspirational to me, um, to keep moving and to keep going. Um, just yesterday I did a 10 mile hike and it was so fun. Um, but yeah, encouraging, I think encouraging people to move in their, whatever their capability is, because your capability not only is, is, can improve, but it also can change. You can be able to do a 10 mile hike yesterday and today things aren't chugging along the way they should be for whatever reason. And it's a, it's a slower day. Um, and so every day is different. Every day is unique. Every body's unique. Um, but encouraging, encouraging movement, I think is a step towards healing for me. I agree with that, but I also uh, tend to find that the push for activity in the transplant community can be a bit daunting. Um, I used to be really uh, very, and found my passion was, was the skiing, snow skiing, and also water skiing. But I've never been, um, Maybe I'm a little bit of a lazy, capricious person. Or long hikes bore me. Um, sorry for all the unpopular opinions. <laughs> um, which is uh, uh, something difficult to um, a point of view, which is not always accepted in the transplant community. Uh, so after my transplant, my obsession was being able to ski again. And I did spent a, a week skiing last winter. I couldn't go for the, I got, I had my transplant two and a half years ago and I went out of the hospital and four days after it was confinement, it was COVID, the first, uh, first wave. So I wasn't able to ski and all I wanted to do was go skiing, which I and doing all that stuff because I just don't like it. Um, and so I think it's also important, like for example, uh, Zach, when I saw your logo, all that stuff, I was like, oh, wow, world transplant athletes, what's that going to be? Um, there is a lot of pressure uh, to, prove, to prove that you are worthy of your organ. You are worthy of the gift that has been given to you and that you're going to push it to the max and that you're going to do it. And I find that sometimes a bit much. Uh, I'm worthy because I am, because I, because I, I know I'm a worthy person. And um, if sometimes I'm lazy, well, you know, that's fine. <laughs> yes, activity is great, but you don't always want to get your steps in. Just that expression, getting my steps in. I try to walk and I do actually, I walk a lot, but I don't feel like I need my 10,000 steps a day or stuff like that because no, I'm just a normal person. I try to be a normal person with all the, the not today aspects. Um, mine and Lawrence's heart transplants are only a month apart. I was a month before. Um, and by the time she had hers and she was so sick afterwards, I felt so bad for you. I was already out hiking. Um, and, um, I think it was really, I think it was good for me to know you, to get to know you because, uh, it kept everything in perspective. I was in a wheelchair before my transplant because my heart was so weak. Uh, I couldn't stand upright, I couldn't walk. Um, and uh, for me, uh, being able to walk, being able to hike um, and everything, uh, that was my dream. And I, I needed to learn that it's not everybody's dream. It's not, uh, you can be a heart transplant recipient and you don't have to hike, you don't have to run, you don't have to do all these things. And uh, and uh, I, would, I would understand if some uh, heart transplant recipients would find me irritating because uh, I know I can make it seem like um, I've had a heart transplant, so this I have to do, but you don't. Uh, you can choose a totally different, uh, totally different activity or no activity. I, I would recommend some activity by all means, but uh, you don't have to be an athlete in the 
you know, in the sense that you run or hike or do any strenuous exercise, uh, it's okay. I love that perspective. And uh, anytime I see the word athlete, I immediately run the other way because I've never been an athlete. Like that's just not something that I, I see the word athlete and I identify with. Um, and for me, after my transplant, the worst part was when they made me get out of the bed the first time and walk down the hallway. And I just remember crying and thinking like, if this is my life, I don't want it. Um, and so I've had to do a lot of like healing for myself with like my relationship to my body and um, expectations that I put on myself or allow other people to put on me. Um, but the thing, I think the thing that made me, an, makes me an athlete is that I'm a singer. Uh, you cannot be a singer without, without your body working properly. And so like Eileen, you wanted to hike like I got out and I was like, I got to go back to school. I want to finish my voice degree. Um, I had to rebuild those muscles and retrain myself uh, to sing and to have breath support and capacity to do the thing that I loved to do. Um, and I think sometimes we see the word athlete and we go, oh God, I'm, I'm not an athlete. But then when you think about it in your own context, like we're all athletes, we're all doing something to get stronger at something that we're passionate about. Um, and you know, as in my work as a chronic illness and organ transplant coach, I talk to people all the time who are like, I don't, I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't feel like doing it. I don't want to go like run a 5k. I'm like, I can relate to that. Um, but it's so much about doing what you are able to do and learning to live in balance with your body and listening to your body. Um, and, and for me, every time I've tried to push myself past what I was capable of, I got sicker. Um, I'd have migraines or like my body would ache for days and then I would just be like out of it. Um, and so learning that balance of like, yeah, going for a walk every day or going up the stairs and down the stairs in my house, like sometimes I don't want to do that. Um, but, but to realize like everybody's being driven by something that they're passionate about and that's what makes them an athlete. Um, that's what helps us keep going and recover. Um, and you know, that's what connected me, um, I mean, as a 20 year old, I, I went to my first transplant games the year after my transplant and I got to meet Chris Klug and I was like, oh my gosh, he's like an actual athlete and he's doing stuff. And it inspired me not to go become an Olympic snowboarder because that would never happen, but it inspired me to pursue my own dreams. Um, and, and those are the kind of things I want people to see across our platforms and our social media and in our advocacy, like, we're not all doing it the same way. We're not all living our life the same way. We're just doing the things we're passionate about. And, oh man, Lawrence, like we're worthy because we're human. Like, I just like, when you said that, it just resonated with me. Like, we're not worthy because we got a, an organ. We are worthy because like, we are crafted uniquely and beautifully. And because sometimes this just happens in life and we don't have an explanation, but we're worthy because of we're people and we matter not because of what we do or how we do it. But there is a lot of pressure to be worthy of your organ. People have to hundred <laughs> percent. And I think a lot of people look at Chris and go, wow, I need to do that. Chris is an abnormality. I know him. He's a complete like beast. I don't know how he does half the things he does. And um, I think to, setting your own goals and really aspiring to what you can achieve and not comparing yourself to anyone else is so important. But um, I just want to touch briefly, we did talk about mental health, but how do you think um, activity may help uh, transplant recipients with their mental health post transplant? Does anyone have something to say on that? I think seeing your own progress is absolutely, absolutely amazing. Um, I can only speak from the heart perspective, but um, so I don't know how it is for like kidney, but literally before my transplant, I could not go and get buy a loaf of bread at the bakery. Sorry, I'm French, this is an important activity for us. Um, <laughs> you have to imagine that there are over 17,000 bakeries in France and Paris, so you never have to walk far away. Uh, I couldn't do that without stopping every 50 meters. So I got used to finding excuses when I would be walking with people, um, I would 
look at the shops, look at the, the most stupid random shops. I would look at um, uh, like a, um, a real estate agency and look at all these apartments. They all look great. Just because I didn't want to admit that I had to stop because I was gonna collapse otherwise. And uh, for me today, um, just walking to walking a couple of kilometers just for any kind of activity, random, I have to go buy something or whatever. But if, I, if there is a possibility of my walking, I walk because every time I walk somewhere, I remember that I used to not be able to. So I think, um, see, I'm getting all emotional about it. I'm still on prednisone. That's what don't, you know, don't worry. <laughs> and um, if I go, for example, to the restaurant, I go out a lot. Um, the toilets in France are always uh, underneath the restaurant in the cellar. So I used to have to, I, was, I would calculate how am I going to get back up if I go to the toilet. And then I would stop in the staircase, but I had to stop in the staircase, not too high, because if I stopped at the end, people would see and catch my breath at one point where people wouldn't see my face. So I'd catch my breath. There were like five steps left, which meant that I could walk the last five steps and, and enter the, the and go back to the table without people realizing that I was trying to catch my breath again. And what's crazy is that two and a half years post-transplant, I skip staircases as scary every single time um and every time i go up a staircase i'm like wow that was so easy i can't believe it um so i think all these that that is and that is like very minimum when you do something that you know that you used to not be able to do it's beneficial for our mental health because it reminds us that now we're here now now it's it's working yeah i've found that training really helps but i train outside quite a lot so i think it's the mix of being outside and i've got a dog which i take out twice a day so i think being outside is really really beneficial for me anyway uh it kind of just keeps me grounded if i'm having a really bad day that that morning walk with the dog just kind of sets you up and the same in the evening if you've had a crap day just to go out into the woods and kind of just stare at nature for a little while uh, and just like i say walking is just good um and then if I do, I never, I never, I hate running, but I still do 5k runs. I never look forward to it, but afterwards, I'm, I'm always really pleased afterwards. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of like uh, Lawrence was saying is because that wasn't something that I could do before. So just the, that achievement, every time I do a 5k, I'm like really pleased that I, I did it, you know, and I'm not even too fussed about trying to push it further. I'm just happy with that. Yeah, maybe the key is, that low hit on it is that the key is not losing your sense of wonder about what you couldn't accomplish before and now you can. Um, and even if that is walking up a flight of stairs with ease, um, that if you have a sense of wonder about, wow, I can still do this. And it, I have the same thing. I, I burst into tears when I got to the waterfall. I've, you know, when I've climbed to the tops of mountains, I burst into tears because that was a pipe dream for me. And, you know, it just, I never thought that that would ever happen. Um, but that doesn't have to be the sense of wonder, you know, accomplishing some physical goal it doesn't have to be your sense of wonder, but I think maintaining some sort of sense of wonder of, wow, I couldn't do that before, but I can do that now. Um, whatever that happens to be. Um, for you, but I think low hit on it. I think it's maintaining that sense of, of like wonder about it all. Whoa. Great. Thank you all. Um, so geez, I'm looking at my notes now and I can't read them all. <laughs> yeah. So new research on the horizon. Does anyone have, um, some new research that they're excited about? Maybe that's coming out. They've heard about, they want to talk to us all. Well, I'll go back a little bit. So uh, my first transplant games was in 2006. Um, and that was the first time I'd been around so many people who had had a transplant, met any living donors, donor families, and then going into like an expo hall full of like pharmaceutical companies and advocates. Um, I remember, like, I think I took away two things from that. I took away, hey, there's a sunscreen that completely blocks the sun. And I need that because I'm really pale. <laughs> and 
that there's constant research. And so like, I can always hold on to hope that there's something coming that's going to change um, the face of transplant. At that point, um, they were just still developing the 24 hour tacrolimus basically, which is um, now like what a lot of patients take as their standard um, immunosuppression medication. I'm not one of those people yet, but I'm still <laughs> still holding out for it. Um, and I just remember thinking, oh my gosh, I could take a pill or two once a day instead of taking pills all the time. Uh, that sounds amazing because at that point I was just still completely overwhelmed by the fact that I had to set timers and take pills throughout the day at different times. And, um, I was like, oh, okay. And then there was this really cool technology that you could wear, like basically attached to your under armor if you were an athlete, so like on impact, it would harden and protect your organs. And I was like, genius. Um, so now I do a lot of work with um, life bulb and transplant life, and they hold these innovation challenges all the time um, where they support up and coming um, new innovations and help fund things. And so I, I'm getting to watch, uh, I feel like history, like progress in a really cool way. Um, even from like xenotransplant talk to, um, you know, the, um, oh gosh, I lost my words, tacro brain, um, <laughs> um, that they're, they're doing different kinds of transplants now, um, still very experimentally. And just the hope that I have for that, um, uh, that's always a big deal to me. Like I have to remind myself that things are constantly changing and that change is not bad. Uh, that change change can be good, and uh, and and reminding myself that transplants have not been going on that long in the context of history, and so we have just a lo a long way to go still, um, and it still feels like we're at the beginning of it in some ways. I mean, I've been on meds for seventeen years, and watching my activity and my mental health, and learning new things that we can help hospitals uh, hone in on and social workers help with, and. Um, I guess my big, my big desire for technology would be that these companies that are raking in money, um, like pharmaceutical companies would start funding, um, small nonprofits that are doing amazing work, like what Denise does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> Me three. <laughs> um, yeah. Although I, you know, I, pharma, far, I, I am so grateful as much as I would like Big Pharma to start sharing the wealth a little bit, I am so grateful that they're doing the innovation that they're doing. Um, I just read an article not that long ago on the future of 3D organ printing. Printing, can you imagine? Um, that is super exciting. Um, it's not on the immediate horizon, obviously, but it's coming. And that is super interesting to me. Um, and the ability to, I know they're doing research on um, helping patients, um, obviously heart and lung are probably going to be the last on this list, but um, to wean us off of, of anti-rejection medication, um, which would be a godsend. Um, and I think that that's, I know, I know a couple liver recipients who are in the program and off, off uh, any kind of rejection medication at all which is just absurd to me, but so cool, so cool. Um, so, so I think, I think those are the things that excite me is things um, that, that maybe won't affect me, but will affect the next generation of, of transplant patients. Yeah, we've actually started working with um, a pharma company who is rolling out a new line of non-invasive rejection uh, testing which is super exciting. They've actually rolled out their kidney um, uh, program and they are working on their liver, which is hopefully going to roll out in November and then slowly through the rest, which is really exciting. Um, but I actually have to run. So I'm going to pass over the moderating to Denise and Brooke. Um, and thank you all for joining us and have a great day. Thanks, Anna. Thanks, Jesse. Thanks, Thanks Anna. Anna. Thanks, Jesse. All right, where were we um, <laughs> on the list? Now I don't have my list in front of me. Um, let's chat a little bit about inequities in transplant, maybe. 
um, and get that to uh, or bring that up. I'm really curious about what Lo and Eileen and Danny see, because I know I know what I see in the U.S., um, but I don't know what you guys see. What do you guys see as as inequities and in transplant? in your country where you are um i don't i don't see any inequity in transplant um but it's a very very transparent system there is one national transplant list and you get listed on this national list uh whatever your hospital is and then um according to the rank you have in the list, which is dependent on so many factors, um, probably obvious to you because I guess it's the same in the US, um, your, your number in the list changes all the time and um, the, the hearts are, the organs, all organs are distributed according to compat compatibility, uh, starting from one, two, three, four, five. So it's extremely um, fair. And I see it in the hospital because I see it in the waiting room. I see it's absolutely all kinds of people. And I know that there's been a lot of uh, people saying that uh, people, people of color, for example, uh, don't get in, enough organs or in France. I don't know the numbers, but it's from what I'm seeing, uh, it doesn't seem to be the case. Totally diverse people. Um, in, a, in, in, in my transplant uh, unit. So this is just my, my observation, but I don't think this is a problem in France from, from what I can see. Danny? Uh, I know in the UK, they have uh, sort of a, uh, a drive to get more people uh, of different ethnicities to become organ donors and blood transfusions because, uh, you know, I think as just a white male, I, I've, I've got a very high chance of getting a, an organ, but as a, as a black male or an Asian male or female, I don't think it's the same. And I think it's because there's less people giving blood and less people um, becoming donors. And, you know, for whatever reasons, whether it's religious reasons or, just the education has not been there for everyone yet. I don't know, but yeah, I, I don't think there's any. I don't. It's definitely not done on purpose because they can't really just be like, "Oh, we're just going to give this to a white person over anyone else," because they've just got to go with what matches. And yeah, so and, and, and from what I've seen on sort of social media drives and stuff like that, they do try to push um, sort of black and Asian communities to become more donors and stuff like that. Eileen? Um, yes, that's, uh, that's been the case in Norway as well. Uh, Norway is a very homogenous uh, society by all means, um, but uh, I know it's, there's been uh, issues with, uh, uh, with um, um, to get information out in different languages. To, um, to our immigrants, uh, and that's very important because uh, they'll need heart transplants, they need to be organ donors, so that's important work. Uh, other than that, I can't see uh, any inequities in our system because uh, like there's this one uh, national transplant center, just, just at one hospital, and there's no... Um, uh, we have uh, everyone is under the same healthcare system, so uh, it's pretty much uh, the same for everyone. So you can pay yourself into a better hospital because uh, all transplants are done uh, at a public hospital. So yeah, the inequity to... level that I see in in the U.S. is there's well, it's many layers. First, it's 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 not the UNO system, um, because that's fairly anonymous. Once you get listed for a transplant, it doesn't matter who you are, what your background is, what your ethnic background is, none of that matters. All, of, all that matters is blood type, body size, are you a match, um, and how sick you are going into it. But it's the getting to the listing part 
um, where there's a lack of education, there's a lack of, um, I, I ran across a story uh, the other day from a doctor friend, a medical doctor, cardiologist friend of mine that, uh, that one of his patients never made it to transplant because he never got the medical care because he wasn't educated enough. His lack of education put him at a disadvantage to get to the medical care that he needed to get him to the transplant list. By the time he finally got in to stay, seek medical care, um, it was too late. And, and there was no, there was no way we could put him on the transplant list because he wasn't healthy enough to survive a transplant. Um, and that's initially the level of inequity that I see is the making it to the transplant list because of myths about organ donation because of lack of education, because of lack of access in the US to, um, to standard of care, just basic standard of care, healthcare, basic standard of care, healthcare, um, that would get, get these amazing, precious people screened and tested and diagnosed early enough that they could get to a solution whether that's transplant or medication or whatever. Um, that's the first level. And then the second level is once you get listed, um, once, you, once you get presented for transplant, um, there's a financial aspect to it, which is why we started Heartfelt Health Foundation. There's a financial aspect to it. You, if you don't have the money to pay for what insurance isn't gonna pay for, um, the biggest of that is post-transplant housing costs. Your, your listing can be delayed. You can be moved to a status seven until you raise the funds. I've watched people be told to go home and have a bake sale. Um, I, I've, I've listened to patients say that they were told to go do a GoFundMe, that they were told to go have bake sale um, so that they could raise the money to pay for the mandatory post-transplant housing. For heart transplant patients, we're required to live within a few minutes of our transplant facility for three months, six weeks minimum, three months, probably more likely. Um, and that's a second mortgage or basically that you're paying um, to relocate to wherever your transplant hospital is. Where I am, that's either moving to Silicon Valley or moving to San Francisco. And neither of those places are inexpensive places to relocate to. And if you don't have the money to do that, what are you going to do? Um, I am. I, I talked to a prospective patient for the foundation just last night who um, she's pregnant and her baby will not survive without a heart transplant. Um, and she needs to relocate from Las Vegas where she currently lives to San Francisco, where the only specialist that deals with neonatal heart disease that requires a transplant immediately upon birth, which is what they're going to do. They're going to put this, they're, they're going to induce labor. They're, uh, when the baby's viable, they're going to deliver the baby. Um, baby's going to go on life support until they hopefully find a, a donor within a few days. That's the goal. But she has to relocate. She's a single mom. She has two other kids. Dad's not in the picture. She's not working. Where are you going to find the money to pay for this? And her baby is out of luck without nonprofits, basically. Um, I would love to see the system change so that patients like her. She's the reason why we do what we do. She's the reason why we do what we do. Um, so that, that these people who should be focused on their family's recovery, their recovery, their baby's recovery, um, don't have to focus on that. They, they, can focus, they can focus on that instead of focusing on how they're going to pay for what is extra, an extraordinary amount of money. Um, it's astounding that we are in a place in this, in this country where we have to even talk about this. It shouldn't be an issue. I would love to see legislation change so that our foundation doesn't have to exist anymore. But the level of unfair, the level of number of times a day that I say this just isn't fair. It isn't right. It isn't fair. None of you want to count. It's the stories that I hear are just 
heartbreaking every single day and they all wrap around money. Now I could talk about this for forever, but I won't, I'll let somebody else talk. No, I think you have such a valid point. Um, and as, as people who, I mean, there are so many different ways to be involved in transplant um, from, you know, and advocating for legislative change, um, raising money, uh, raising awareness. Um, and I think for me, it always has to come back to like these real stories of real people. Um, cause I, it's so easy when you're advocating <laughs> with, with legislatures to talk about how policy needs to change to forget that the, the reason is that people, uh, that people are at the heart of it and that lives matter. Um, and no, no parent would want to have to make the kind of decisions that this mom is having to make. Um, and so I'm just, yeah, that story has kind of floored me, Denise. I mean, it keeps happening. It's not like this is the first time that it's happened. Um, and it also ties into this like support system you're required to have post-transplant, right? Like, a lot of people have no control over what kind of support they have financially, um, all of that. I was just gonna say to, to kind of sum it all up is, and from what I've learned from my chats is, uh, we are all transplant patients, but we're all very different and everyone's transplant journey is different. So it's very important that, okay, it's great to take inspiration from other people, but it's very important that we realize that it's our own journey. Um, yeah, and not to put too much pressure on ourselves to be like another transplant patient. You just have to be you and do what's best for you. That's it. Is that everybody's everybody's adventure is is unique and it is indeed an adventure. Well, I think this has been a really productive conversation. <laughs> um, I've gotten a lot of insight from it, and I I agree that these are the kind of ongoing conversations that are really going to add value to our community and help us all feel more supported and uh, maybe see some differences and some similarities across the world of what we're dealing with.